to introduce himself a bit. Uh, I'd like to also introduce Peter. Uh, we're going to have two presentations right now that cover uh, some of the history of two of our focused formats, FFB1 and um, Matroska. The, these presentations will cover a bit like issues of implementing them, how they were originally made, and where these uh, formats are going. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Peter. Hello again. Um, you really gave back so much of this stuff that you really Good education to your parents and grandparents, especially mine, we'd be really, really proud of you. <laughs> Peter's in a good company, and I think they don't cheat, it's good. And I hope you like chocolate. So, this is going to be a short history about almost everything. I stole this title from the book. Sometimes I do read books, and that was a really good one. So, in this case, F51 timeline from the most objective perspective that I could get. It's, in 2003, someone wrote this codec. This will be really quickly because we will dive into detail. So don't worry if I kind of lost on you. 2003, somebody called Michael Niedermeyer created this codec basically just for fun. And in 2006, three years later, well, Tests were done, nobody complained about anything, so bit stream was frozen. So the layout of the bits inside the file, it was like, okay, now this is going to be compatible with future versions. So after 2006, <coughs> files that were created after this date are guaranteed to be readable by future decoders. In 2009, something weird happened. You have this ball that we live on with lots of blue and some green. And on the opposite sides of this planet, like in the United States and in Europe, probably it's not so opposite, but pretty far apart from each other, two people kind of stumbled over this last little codec from uh, the need of looking for a preservation codec. We'll figure out who these, these two guys were later. But they were not talking to each other until now. In 2010, funding improvements happening, and in 2012, more stuff like multi-threading, slice C, and corpus for RGB. And in 2013, like a few years later now, after it was picked up as an interesting candidate, it was like, okay, officially release of the new bit stream that has all these awesome features in it. In 2014, the Performa project that you've heard from Ervin got involved, and now it kind of gave it more resources to do like the serious part of that standardization. This is where we are now, 2016, standardization in progress. That was the boring part of this timeline, but it's the objective overview. So the coding is 13 years old. 2010, I actually got involved in December 2009, but Nothing really happened at that time, except for that this guy here, Hermann Levitz from the Austrian Media Take, the National Audiovisual Archive in Vienna, um, said, hmm, we want to do video in a serious way. We really want to digitize our collection. And he's gone around and asked people, like, what are you using as a format? He got different answers that we've seen before. And he asked around, especially with the candidate at that time being MXF in J2000, lost us inside, people using it. There were only a few. I should also use the slides because they like my cheat sheet. The input he got from asking people what they use for preserving image, moving image in a lossless way, actually made us to reconsider the whole thing and go for don't use codecs on containers. There's so much issues with it. Nobody has found anything that really works in a lossless way, very important. Most of the people are doing lossy still. So we went back to, what if we just do image formats? Like, like the film people do, like just one file per frame and then an audio file with it. And this is how I got into this project. Like, okay, research for an alternative that could be useful as a long-term preservation format for moving image without going into the hell of all the issues of codecs and containers and the lack of existing useful things at all in 2009. 
So the start of 2010. We evaluated Chibik lossless, uh, Chibik LS, it really exists, hardly anyone knows it. Chibik 2000 is an image format, bitmap, PNG, and all kinds of bit like, image formats. And at the same time, we started drafting a workflow system because we knew <coughs> if we don't have a video file, we'll need some system that gets the stuff from the archive so we can actually work with it. It didn't turn out too good because there were some issues with color spaces, like you hardly find any wide UV supports in image formats. And the ones that had didn't support lossless, and it was like very frustrating. And after we ran performance tests of handling image sequences, uncompressed and an uncompressed video file, same file size, same data, but the performance difference was so great, just opening it, just like accessing it from a hard drive, we're not even speaking about over the network. It's like if you have thousands of files in one file, it makes a difference from a performance perspective. So we decided after two months of research, we go back and give the container codec thing another chance. But there's not a big choice of lossless codecs. The one I knew and I was working with was Hufyuf, or Hufyuf, or however you call it, it's written like this. It's just short for Huffman YUV, it's a lossless encoding, which is really fast, but it doesn't compress that well, but it worked, and it was really easy, and it was use usable instantaneously on Windows platforms that we had to support at that time, so we could capture it. So I did some research for this, well, since we were not too happy with the compression, it was like, hmm, let's do some more research. And then I stumbled over a paper by a Russian university. They compared lossless codecs. And I think they have the most complete list of lossless codecs um, somebody ever gathered. And two interesting candidates <coughs> popped up on this codec test result. The one scoring really good had this weird name, like the Final Fantasy version one. Um, so it was like, okay, in German, it's FFI, it's nice, but FF1, I remember my English teacher, she's like, there's the V and the V, and it's a different thing in English. So this is like really, really mean name for everybody who's like forced to say it out in English, and since we meet on an English language base, this is like FFV1. <laughs> FF4 ends in Vienna. <laughs> so, I think one score scored really good, but it was like, what is this? Where does it come from? Does anybody know about this? Has anyone heard about this? So, um, we lost the round, people were like, uh, FF what? So, we were like, okay, 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 um, me, I'm a developer. Oh, about my background. Uh, I actually studied computer science, so I'm one of these computer guys who ended up in archiving because I needed to get a job to pay my university time. And I kind of ended up in archiving, what was really cool, because lots of challenges, lots of puzzles, and as a computer guy who likes to hack stuff, you see the outcome here. So we got after one and Um Score really good. But I looked at the code, and in the code of after the one it said, this codec is marked experimental. And I said, okay, we're going to do tests. And if I spend time testing a codec for serious archiving, I'm not going to use a format that says experimental. So I dropped it first. And we put it back in a few months later. Um, where is it? Um, it looks really good. Let's reconsider it for testing, um, especially because the long-term preservation properties were really perfect. It was like, okay, we got the smart file size, small as JB2000 lossless, way faster. It's open source free software, so we can actually preserve the source code, which equals archiving your... If you think in a physical world, like, imagine you could archive your recorder replayer, like the hardware, including schematics and building components. That would be like the, the holy grail for long-term preservation. 
and with free software open source license, we could actually do this. So we said, hmm, okay, so for long-term preservation, we could actually have a virtually immortal format from a purely technical perspective. Because if something happens in the future and we run into Alien Technology 3000 that doesn't support FFmpeg binaries of now anymore, someone in the future could just go and hmm, well, but at the MediaTek, they, they archived the source code and others also did this because every developer has a complete copy of the code in all its revisions on their computer. Here's the code, please make it work with Alien Technology 3000. You don't say it's easy, but at least it's possible, probably, or more likely than if you have a black box. So we said, this is a really good starting point for preservation code. But it's not as expected. So, that's a detailed evaluation of the suitability for long-term preservation. And then I said, it's just too good. I want to use it. Please, can I, please, please, can we use this? And he said, yeah, I don't know. Did you actually ask the developer why it's marked experimental? And I'm like, ooh. ooh. OK, so I did. So I wrote to the FFmpeg developer mailing list, and I said, um, dear sir, stroke madam, um, please I would like to know what is the current status of FF31? Uh, it says it's marked experimental, but how far is it from production? Blah, blah. Long story short, Michael Niedermeyer replied and said, oops, I forgot to take out the word experimental in the source code for three years now. Um, so it's actually stable since 2006. Have fun. And I was like, whoa, we have this code. That was like too good to be true. And now it's not even experimental anymore, but stable for three years. Continue work and testing. So we did. As I said, this is a very subjective history telling because it's what we did for pure egotistic reasons, because we wanted something that works and that we can use in the National Archive. Budget was tight. Actually, we would have needed something that would work yesterday already, of course, as everyone. And then I said, hmm, well, let's focus on our, our material first. And that's PAL, standard definition resolution, 25 frames, 422 subsampling, because a lot of the tapes we have in the archive is VHS. So, and then DD beta and DD and Monty, but a lot of VHS. No time code, no production stuff, no, no things that cause a lot of problems. And so we said, ooh, we're really lucky. We just have to get moving image and sound. And then someone else is like, do the tests. And I'm like, tests on fine. We can use that if we want. We can guarantee that we can open it in the future or transcode it if we want to still easier, cheaper, faster, and with less issues than any other format promotes it to be used for lossless encoding at that time and still. So um, I was still locked in the basement doing development and tests. Hammond went out into the world and said, I will tell the world that we have found a third option. <laughs> he didn't say it with this accent, but it gives it a more like it was a historical moment that he said, hey, look at this. In the call for presentations of this conference, they say, there's uncompressed in Cherry 2000 lossless. And I'll sneak in there and say, you might be a third option. So I think this is where he actually met Dave Rice. He met Dave there, right? Um, I didn't know what he was. Um, it's a very short name. So it's like the weird guy, the, the small, weird, strange person with a long name, and then there's Dave with a short name. Like, Rice, it's so, so short. It's like, yeah. And I said, sounds interesting because they said, hey, man, it's really nice that you say, speak about FF1. I think it's also very interesting. We should stay in contact. When he returned back, we were still running tests for HD and VM because we knew we would not be doing SD material forever. It's, it's a finite number. And I wanted to know how FF1 could handle larger resolutions, if there were limits in the implementation, how the performance was, what about more bits per component. So still in 2010, we contacted Vito Maya, said, could we actually make it faster? He said, maybe. We said, please. Uh, in 2010, in the middle uh, of 2010, actually, uh, I was curious and I was Googling uh, if FFV1 appeared anywhere else. If anybody else saw this, I wanted information. 
I wanted to, to know why is this too good to be true? Why did I not hear of it anywhere else? And in some paper in, uh, in the Dutch language, but I think it's actually Belgium, because London, Devon, no. um, it was actually mentioned compared with JB2000 losses. Now, this is very interesting, but I don't understand it in detail because it's the wrong language. Um, but you can, you can look it up, there's the ISBN number. That was the first occurrence officially of FFV1 in the paper, as far as I know. So we continued testing and provided feedback to the developer and developers, and I published testing results, and so on and so on. And we just did this for like a long time. Until in October something really, really thrilling happened. Who of you knows what a fork of a program, like project, coding project is? Yes, 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 yes. Who does not know what a fork is? There's, there's a nice saying between developers. It says, if you disagree with what we write here, then just fork off. <laughs> um, it's, it's like the fork of a road. So you've got like happy developers uh, doing their stuff, and they're like, yes, we think we're doing, we're working on the same thing, and we agree, and, and everything, and we're just, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. You did this? Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I, don't, I don't agree with this. You, you should, but I don't. Like, fork off. So it just like, you take the code, and you spawn a separate project, basically starting with the same code, and then you go different directions, depending on what your disagreement was about. Now in the media take, we sat, like, watching the news, like, um, you have all these black and white imagery from the news back in history when, when history class was like, and this is how the first world war started. It's like, there were two gentlemen meeting, and one said, oh, I don't like your shoes. And like, I'm gonna bomb your country. And things start out in a really weird way. So we were watching this Lib AV fork, and I was like, we don't like you guys. We don't like you guys. No, we don't like you guys. I, we don't, I, I don't know these people. I haven't met any one of them in person. Some of them yet, but not too many. So we're like, <laughs> we have this small gem. Is it called gem or gem? Like a diamond thing? Gem. Gem. Gem? It's gem. We have it in there, and, and, and now, now we kind of like, we invested money and time, like making it like multi-threading faster than, and, 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 Oh no, they're working. What shall we do now? Is this like, this is it, this is the end. Because they disagree with each other and they don't like each other and it's a very personal thing because the codec is a personal baby of Michael Niedermeyer and the little baby guys said, we don't like Michael anymore. So it was like, oh no, but then we said, hmm, it's released on an open source license so we can just go and patch the other side, or have someone else patch it in the other side, we're not locked in. We're not like, oh no, the vendor's splitting up, the company's dissolving, we cannot do anything, please, dear market gods, fulfill our archival needs, we will also like kill chicken, or I don't know what's necessary. <laughs> it wasn't necessary. We're just like, okay, we'll just see where this goes, and um, once it stabilizes, until then we'll continue to work on FFV1 improvements, and then make sure the patches go over to the other project as well. So, in March 2011, it was like, at the MediaTek, we said, we've tested our workflow in this system now. It's going to be lightning to talk about this tomorrow, I guess. Um, and we said, okay, we use this codec. We start to digitize for the archive. Testing ended. This works. In April 2011, like, a long time after the Yahoo conference that Hannah told me about this, that this person existed. I was like, dear Mr. Rice, we have a problem with DV video, and uh, you seem to be experienced with this digital format. Um, that was how Dave and I met in, in the virtual email world. And then his name popped up on the FFM list. And I was like, okay, so we were kind of like the two archivists that, by coincidence, stumbled over FFV1 because we're digging in this weird open source pool that most other people seem to like ignore in terms of long-term preservation. 
So we were those two weird guys on the other side of the globe that kind of stumbled over this and then talked to each other. And then said, okay, uh, I said, hey, we started hiring Nehemiah for improvements. And, you know, and then they've chipped in. So in August 2011, we had the first version of our Digitalization Ninjas workflow system release that was like kind of built around supporting FFP1. It was actually designed to handle the image sequences. But we said, yeah, but now we've got something better. So this thing was designed to use the lossless code from ingest to retrieval and anything back and forth. Or in 2012, they had so much happening in the movie, that's why the, the, the vast majority of events happened in 2010. So now in 2012, they said, he, he honored the idea of what about error resilience fixity information inside the bitstream. He, he mentioned this before. And when we came up with what could we do with a new version of FF1, uh, another main developer of FF1 said, there was this Dave Price guy. He mentioned something about this. Maybe this is interesting. And the needle man said, yeah, we can do this. And the version 2 never was released. This is why if you go up and you go like, OK, that's FF1 version 1. And there's FF1 version 3. What about 2? Two? 2 just contained multi-threaded improvements. So it could use more cores of the CPU and work faster. But then, while it was still work in progress being developed, the slice CRC got added, which changed the layout of the bitstream. So we said, OK, then just drop the number 2 and go for number 3. So now you know the legendary story why there should be no files after few one version two. If you see some, collect them and show them to your grandchildren and say, see, I've got one of those rare things. <coughs> 2012, lots of things happening. Yeah, Gipich, sitting right here, was hired by the Austrian Film Archive to add more than 8-bit per component support for RGB color space. Because the Austrian film archive said this FF1 code it might be interesting. We're not actually planning to use it yet. But if we're going to consider it from the perspective of a film archive, we need to have definitely have more than 8 bit per component for RGB. Here did this, and that was the first real proof of concept that the theory we had, if we needed something with this format, we could hire a developer. Preferably one that we know and one who is on site with the person, like with the, with the people actually working with it. Um, and then this change went upstream. And since that time, like everybody can do up to 14 bits per component for RGB. Why only 14? Okay. Are you still smiling now? Uh, but he said it's not impossible. He just said he didn't want to change too many lines of codes. And 14 bits was a very easy reachable goal. And I'm like, really cool. So we had people actually do this in real life. Our theory is proven. In other specific months in 2012, um, we had like more talks with other archives, more member institutions, a lot of people calling us really, really crazy uh, and really unprofessional, and other things that my grandparents would not want me to say out in public. Because they taught me that if you have nothing good to say about a person, don't say anything at all. That's why there are a lot of people not mentioned in here. <laughs> um, but I met them in Singapore. Uh, additional co-funding of FFP1 improvements. I think this was, a, this was an information I wanted to have in there. It was not just the media take who said, we'll raise some money and pay for improvements of FFP1. But there was also the Austrian film archive who chipped in something and they, they put in money. And then there's a company, Noah, I used to work for before, and we also have a developer from them giving a talk afterwards. And they said, hmm, actually, there is no real lossless codec useful in real life. So this is one thing. It might be interesting. What is your situation? What is the status? And I said, well, we're working on it. And um, they chipped in with some money to actually speed up the official release of Bitstream version 3. So, now, now you see, this is like this. This result, what we have right now, is like a real-life proof of concept. What you can do from the user's point of view, from the point of view of a memory institution, 
it was not a lot of budget we had to raise. I will not say all of this because it's actually uncomfortably affordable. Uh, and then we had something that not only allowed us at the option of the take to do this, but also everyone else having the same situation. And everybody who, who put in another piece of the puzzle to this whole construction, like then QC tools came up and the media content and so on, and everybody could use everything. And I was like, wow, this is public money used great. And also proprietary companies said, ooh, we still profit from this, so let's also do this. So now, my test results were quite satisfactory, but the testing was not yet finished, it's 2012, so this ran as a sidetrack. I was doing most of it on a computer in my spare time, because there's always more work than you could do uh, in your work time, but I thought this thing is too good to be true to just not make it because of lack of resources. There were a lot of institutions who were like, oh, this sounds interesting, tell me when it's done. And I'm like, thanks for not helping. Um, they were, most of them basically now are the ones that complain like, oh, but it's not as fast as we were hoping it to be. And like, that is really, really constructive. Yes, thank you, more of this, more of this, yes. Um, I drank a lot of coffee, smoked a lot of cigarettes, put a lot of work into this, that you have this now and you can just use it. And please, thank you, sir, for just complaining at me. Can you please point this into the direction of developers, including something we call money or whatever to actually make it worthwhile for them because we all profit a lot. And here a lot of our institutions would say, oh, we don't have any money. Like, seriously? We, we have like a, a coin pay per coffee machine now? Because we can't afford the coffee. And then, that this is the answer you get when you ask them for like, if we could raise resources to make this format uh, to, to pay developers for an open solution that we offer. Sorry, you want a coffee? It's not doable, it's like public money, we're getting cut down. Yes, we do not have as much budget in public institutions, but when I see how much they pay for closed black box, please pay again for every problem that we've cost you, uh, solutions, then I want to raise this idea of this thing, like this open source stuff. It's not unprofessional and for free, it's like it enables people to like, oh, okay, we're gonna actually make it work if we find others, we pull in the resources, we get amazing solutions for less of the money. Um, why not? And everybody's happy. So talking about everybody being happy, we've got this fork thing in the past, and now we head out to 1.3 uh, in a state where we said, yeah, yeah, we, we could actually, that, that, that is it. It's not officially released yet, but yeah, that is it. And I, and I talked to Liberty developers and said it would be really nice if they could kind of merge the changes we've had been developing in FFmpeg right now. And Luke Babato was so nice, he's an FFmpeg uh, Liberty developer, oh my god, it's uh, who was so nice to like go, okay, I'll take a look at this. He looked at the code, he cleaned it up, he merged it into LibAV, and from that point on, I knew whatever application is going to use FFmpeg or LibAV libraries, they're all gonna support FF3.1 in version one and three. And that was a major breakthrough because then you could just lean back and say, ah, now we've got the situation we've had before the fork again because we knew that VLC, a very important component, uses FFmpeg libraries. And after the fork, it wasn't sure whether to use this or that code. And now this was not a problem at all. And since then, FF3.1 is maintained in both libav and FFmpeg. And the, the patches mostly go back and forth. So we've reached 2003, we're almost to the present. August 2013, I brought a bottle of alcohol-free champagne to the office because this was like, now we have the official release of version 3. Now everybody's allowed to use it, guaranteed that it will be readable by future versions of the decoder. 2014, so you see 2013, what happened? Um, 14, I met uh, Bert and Emmanuel, Emmanuel from PACT at the Fostum. By complete coincidence, it was like, oh, they were doing this, and, blah, blah. and they were telling me about the Performa project, which you heard before, and, and they said, yeah, we're looking at that if you want. 
And then we chatted, like, what was our experience? We were already working with it productively since 2011. So at the media ticket, it was quite an experience based on like real life use cases. Um, and then they were looking for companies that actually implement these performance checkers. And that's where they appeared again on the radar, um, with, together with Chevron from the area. And they got the, how do you translate it? The like, okay, they were chosen to implement the conformance checker for moving image file formats, which I was really happy to say this because I knew from previous work from these two guys that they were making tools built for the job, not built for selling a beautiful package. They also have a beautiful package, but it's like really designed in a technically good way. So reaching 2015, we're now right in the middle of what's kind of happening here. It's Tessa Fleming, what is Tessa? I haven't seen her today. <coughs> here um, she was on the performer team put together by Dave, and that was when FFV1 and Trotsky discussion was opened on the IETF discussion thread. Also in that month was the first release of MediaConch, as far as I researched. Sharon may correct me. What? This is right. This is right, yeah, thank you. Um, and that's something I had to put in there because it was really, that was, I, I read it all like, <laughs> there's the Fiat IFTA International Conference for Radio and Television Archives. This is like broadcast, broadcast is different than archiving. And it's a very serious conference. And it was happening in Vienna. And in the call for papers, it said, is that if we won the new year of 2000? I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Uh, I hope it's not. Um, but I think they mean it in a good way. <laughs> and then I was like, uh, Dave, Dave, I think they're actually asking for somebody presenting there. And then uh, Tessa, Bert, and I, they couldn't make it. Uh, Actually, we had a, a, a session for this master's college at a broadcasting, at the technical broadcasting conference. It was amazing. It was like, wow, we, we've got this far. And, and, and no, no, no rotten tomatoes or eggs or anything, no banana peels. Like, interested faces in the audience, some of them not that happy, but I don't know why. In, Moving on to December 2015, the official seller mailing list was opened where people still, including you if you want to, can discuss and view and watch and participate on the future of these formats and also like the standardization process. And there we have it. In January 2016, that was the first mention of something called FFV 1.4. There was a really nice guy from an Irish film archive who uh, said, ooh, ooh, if, if there's a new version coming up, we've been playing around with FF1 for a film, and there's some stuff about color and so on. And this is still an ongoing discussion where I would like to have people who deal with film digitization maybe participate, because I, I can code, I can act as if I can code, uh, I can use really difficult words that a lot of people who study computer science will say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and archivists will say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not too familiar with them. So that's like one of the topics. It's like color handling in FFV1, so it supports nonlinear color spaces. And this discussion was started in January 2006, and now in March, uh, there was the Joint Technical Symposium in Singapore, and I found it really amazing that it was like opened in the keynote speech by Gato Poma, who is also here. He mentions FF1, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, this is like so amazing that a small bunch of people actually managed to do something that everybody else said was really impossible. Now we're sitting here, and this, Symposium in Berlin. Might be slight to do two more slides just to round it up. It was quite the journey. I said it was a very, very subjective 
point of view. It was tears, it was laughter, it was like oh, moments of anger and passion and everything. It's like you can actually make a movie out of this, especially I'd be interested in who plays Michael Ingemann. <laughs> and this is why I'm really happy that we've gotten from I'm quoting myself now. <laughs> I dug out the very first email I wrote to Nina Meyer, the actual inventor and author of F1. And maybe I was too passionate, but I put this in there to kind of give him a motivation what we're actually trying to do here. And I said, I love to see a free coding being promoted as a format for long term video archives. Because currently it's chaos in the archive world because there is no standard or best practice at the moment. Well, some people would say, of course there's a standard. Uh, didn't you read the Isaac paper about the standards that are actually in use? But what I meant is there was really no best practice that was actually working for most of us. That was Peter B. in April 22nd, 2010. And a few days before I got here, I received this from the Musée de Art Contemporain. Uh, my French is really bad. It's the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal, in Canada. And Etienne Desautet said, well, all I can say now, it just works. We really have no problems at all. We have digitized mostly from the Nazi account, compressed by and so on, and then converted to F31 MKV. And I was like, really nice to hear this like a few days before I got here, so I put it on as the last slide. So here we are, no time to wait. There's a slide asking for questions, but I put this on while I give you the chance to say a question. Thank you very much. Do you have time for questions, or should we put that up for later? I have a question. You have a question? No, I said you could have a question. I could have a question. <laughs> question? Change is made to the source code of either FFmpeg or the baby. It's run, uh, all these automated tests are run, and they are there to point out regressions and stuff like this. There's still work to be done. It's on my to do list for three years now. Um, but so far, it's there was no objection from the LibAV developers. They know we're not going to do F31.3, and they were really constructive and the yeah, FFM people merged back their changes and everything and also it made things actually better and it uh, uh, <coughs> whatever that word is in English it's, it was so that Michael Niedermeyer started the first line of code on the multi-threading version because of the fork because we saw there was discussion going on in the FFmpeg mailing list. They were like, mm -hmm. and it seemed like he needed something that made him happy. I can only do estimations. And then he saw at exactly that time, you see the first changes for multi threading F51. Um, so right now, I cannot say that there was any bad thing coming out of this. More, more positive stuff actually than negative. Anything else? Um, you say this preservation is available. Where, where will it be available? The presentation? Yes. That depends on where the nice organizers of this event will generally put the slides. 
um, so far it's going to be download.dunspanishreflection.com slash mt, that pd slash mthk slash presentation slash 2016. Okay, we can put it on the But I can send it. <laughs> It's already online, but it's going to be online officially, right? Yeah, yeah. As soon as we have Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> and then I didn't put any pictures in there. I apologize. But I thought, like, I was told that reading books is really cool because you get all the images in your head, and nobody can make a better image than your own mind for yourself. This is why the movie, after the book, always sucks. So I hope you get a really good image of your mind. Any other questions? You mentioned the Lager with Kodak, what happened to this? Ah, is it dead now? If you look at the source code of this presentation, which is actually HTML5, you will see an HTML comment that points to an archive.org link of Lagerit that is now removed because in the history of Lagerit and the reason why the developer developed it, he said, actually he's warning against using FF1 for archiving. Um, we, Lagerith, we dropped it from our list because it didn't support a lot of subsampling that we were aiming for. And it was very Windows focused at the time when we picked it up, when we, when we saw it, like the implementations that were existing. It came into FFmpeg in a reasonable version later. And I asked in the FFmpeg development list, like, what about Lagerith as a lossless codec? And then Jason Garrett Glaser, who uh, is also known as the nickname Dark Shikari, or main developer of X264, the H264 implementation probably used most in the world. He said, I wouldn't use Lagerith because of the um, ways the floating numbers are represented. And I think there's a quote online somewhere, I, I haven't put it in there to, to not overdo it, is I wouldn't use it because if you look at it from a slightly wrong angle, the whole thing falls apart. That was the information I got from the series developer, so I thought, okay, well, I, I, I should free this pretty important. Ah, that, that might be what, what Jason meant, in, in terms of like how the numbers are interpreted, because if it's doing floating point processing hardware dependent, and you encode it on one machine and then when I decode it on another, things might go wrong. That's what we talked about. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest.